Yogi, I hope you're doing well. Welcome into the game here in Tuscaloosa. Yeah, thanks for having me. I love talking to you guys. I know how much you love football down there, man. Hey, we have not mentioned the NBA playoffs, but one probably <laughs> 90 seconds uh, today. It's all a bit about Perfect. college football and the Elite 11. So it's a it's a fun conversation. We're, we're trying to highlight, and uh, we said, man, we'll, we'll be able to get on and, and talk about it for a couple of minutes with you. But uh, walk us through the process to get to the weekend, and then we'll get to the weekend and kind of recap. But uh, it takes a lot of work to get to the Elite 11 camp. Uh, to make in all these quarterbacks that get their way there. Yeah, I know it's an amazing journey. You know, I think to give it context, this is the 20th year of the Elite 11. Um, think of, I guess, for your audience, you've never heard of it, think of American Idol for high school quarterbacks, per se. Uh, we go around the country, all really starting uh, at the Super Bowl, and go all across to every region and offer free high school camps for quarterbacks all across the country who want to showcase their skill set. Um, now, thousands uh, submit their high school recruiting film. Our staff evaluates it, and we invite anywhere from 80 to 100, 120 kids to these regionals um, all across the country, uh, really, so you don't have to get on the plane. If you're a young man, you can get in a car, and you can drive and show your stuff. And we did it because we never wanted uh, someone to say, I didn't get a shot, right? That existed for, for so many years, or I didn't have the money to do it. Uh, you know, us partnering with Nike and our sponsors wanted to kind of create that environment. So once we do that, look for roughly, we look at about 1,000 kids per year. Then we narrow it down. And this year we narrowed it down to 24, which came to the Elite 11 finals over the weekend. And then from there, uh, we chose our top 12, uh, which were announced today, then head out to the opening, which is the top 160-plus student-athletes, rising seniors in the country who compete this year. It'll be in Dallas, um, in Frisco, at that facility, and they'll compete to be the best in class at their position, and for the Elite 11, ultimately the Elite 11 MVP. All right, and this weekend, you invited a couple of former guys back in J1 Hurts and Tua Tungvaluwa. Yeah, it was awesome. I mean, the counselor session, uh, for me at least, the guy I've hosted this show for 10 years and been a coach um, on the staff, the counselor session has always been the most powerful one, to be quite honest with you. Um, we've had from Carson Palmer to Aaron Rodgers, um, the who's who. I mean, if you look at the NFL, I want to say uh, 23 or 26 of the projected starters this year came through the Elite 11. Um, last year, there was 23 starters in Power 5 conferences that came through the Elite 11, um, you know, or, or were, the, were Elite 11 finalists. So it's a, it's a lot of guys, right? The Heisman, uh, I think 11 of the last 12 Heisman Trophy winners who were quarterbacks came through the Elite 11. So it's kind of the who's who. So when the college, college guys get to come back, uh, we love it. You know, number one, uh, these young men admire and look up and want to be these guys. And for the Jalens of the world and the Tours, they want to get back. Um, I think this game always wants to get back. You know, we, we believe, and I think you'd agree, it's the ultimate team sport. And uh, to have those guys be candid, work out, train, teach. Uh, we have counselor sessions where I interview each counselor in front of the, the high school quarterbacks, and they're very honest, they're very frank about the good, bad, difficult that comes with being a major you know, stud in college football at a place like Alabama, both of those guys playing as true freshmen. So they brought great insight because every one of the 24 that were there all dream of playing in the natty and throwing the game winner. So uh, a lot of questions, a lot of dialogue. And for us, it was, it was great because the theme this year was based around the concept of I am, you know, and, and who I am versus being told who they are, which happens with the media. Guys like us, we say what we think people are. Recruiting services tell kids literally what ranking they are and what star they are. Um, and we wanted to flip that. So we talked to them about redefining, you know, and maybe for the first time defining who they are and what they're about so they could bring it back to their team. And you couldn't have a greater example than those two young men from Alabama to talk about the power of team and the power of understanding who you are and what you're about. And, and they gave some of the best speeches in the history of Elite 11 when they talked to the student athletes. Wow. And, and both of these individuals that we've covered here, I mean, you know, the unfortunate part is somebody's going to win the quarterback competition here and then somebody's going to have to be the second string guy. But you look at them, both of them quality ambassadors from the University of Alabama. Yeah, I mean, find one better, you know, like it's in this era. I think it's easy to go back and, you know, there's a bunch of them. But I've always said this. I think in recruiting, when I was getting recruited or players even 10 years ago, we were on the 10th floor of a building. And I say that meaning when our careers ended and the building crumbled, our world you know, fell apart, we sprained an ankle and we fell, right? Now, guys are on the 50th floor of that building, and we've seen depression double, at least in terms of people talking about it. 
in recent years. Anxiety, triple, you know, in recent years. So when you look at those things, that's what happens when all the attention's on you. So we want to make sure we talk about those elements when you've got guys that are dealing with that. And, and I think it's an era that, uh, or an area that people don't want to talk about. Coaches don't want to talk about it, uh, for the most part, uh, up until recently. And I think that, uh, it's going to be one of the more, more areas of growth in major college programs and all the head coaches I've talked to, um, and programs I talk to and cover, they've all been invested in it. You know, you look at Stanford, you know, kind of the leading research school. I think anyone would, I don't think anyone would argue in Power Five, probably the best academic institution in the country. Um, they're leading the charge in that regard, making sure that we're giving these young men the tools to deal with what's going to happen in college. So, two guys that dealt with stardom um, and dealt with all the things that come with that, uh, we're able to talk to guys and be real about it. And you're right, somebody's going to start, somebody's going to be the backup, and both are probably going to play. But that's the reality of this position. You know, it is, unfortunately, it's not like receiver or offensive line where you can have a bunch of studs and they all get to play the same amount. And they both know that. And they, and they talked about how great of a teammate the other one was. It, was. it was really special to hear them talk about each other, um, to hear, you know, Tua talked about in, in the locker room of the national championship game at halftime. You know, Jalen went up to him and said, hey, it's just like high school football in Hawaii. And Tua said that that spoke volumes. You know, think of that stage, that moment, and then obviously Tua went out and did what he did. Uh, that, to me, is what a great example of what team truly needs. Being a former coach and around that quarterback position, you feel a little sorry for Nick Saban that's going to have to make this big decision? No, not at all. <laughs> I mean, I it's a luxury, but I mean, it, it's 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 going to be a difficult one. I mean, you got a guy that's twenty six and two, and you got a guy that's won a national title for you. Yeah, look, I think the challenge, I've always felt this. Um, we used to say this at SC uh, when we would get, you know, think of the quarterbacks that have been rolling through there. You, you earn the right to play and earn the right not to. And same thing with the Elite 11. You know, guys earn the right to be in the top 12 and earn the right not to be. And it's a tough sentence to swallow, but it's the truth. And I think for this instance, it's going to be such small fractions of differences between these two players because they both bring dynamic things to the table. Clearly, you referenced it. Both of them are winners. Uh, they have that pedigree. Both of them are, are infectious. You know, we define the ish factor at the little 11 as uh, when you walk into the room, people feel your presence, and you make those around you better. They both clearly do that. Uh, I would imagine they have mastery of the system and the offense. So there's going to be the small things that Coach Saban and his staff are going to have to decipher of what matters for them and their program. And I think it's going to go beyond turnovers critical downs and distances. I think it'll be even more nuanced than that. And it's going to be hard, you know, but uh, that's, that's the gig, you know, so you sign up for it and everybody knows it. And every one of these quarterbacks, we talked about it um, the day after signing day, I like to call it national unfollow day. You know, nobody really cares as much as you think they do. And the coaching staff trying to find someone better than you. And that's just how it works. And that's what creates, uh, the competitive landscape, which is college football, it's up to the coaches to make sure they manage it properly. And that's, to me, probably where I'll be more interested in how Coach Saban and his staff handle it and manage the psyche of the team who's going to be reactive to the decision that's made because that's just the reality of being a human. And then, of course, the individual who's going to be told, you're rolling out and getting the first snap, and you you got to stay ready for potentially the second one. And, and that, to me, is going to be the dance that, that I think is what coaching is managing those personalities and being aware of the fragile elements that really are, are part of an entire team and the fabric of a program. Yogi, being in that position and coaching quarterbacks like you've done at the high level and part of the Elite 11, let me ask you, where does Jalen Hurt, pluses and minus, where would you like to see him take some steps? Talk about his game, but also where you think he could grow the most. I'm a big fan of Jalen. I mean, I mean, this is a guy who's really intelligent, right? You look at what he's done in the classroom. Uh, we had a long talk the first day he got there saying, it's about school. And we just talked about where he's going academically and what he's studying and what his major is. Uh, and then we talked about managing, um, you know, that community, you know, and, you know, there's a lot, right? That There's a lot of eyes on football players, right? There's not a lot else going on. That's what makes a difference in the Pac-12, for instance. You know, we could have a star in SC, Sam Darnold, but, he's not going to get stopped walking down the street. You know, it's going to be, Hey man, I may know you, but I also know the other guy in front of you and behind you. It's not that big of a deal. That's just the Los Angeles community. Um, so it's different 
You know, we talked about that. I think when you're talking about his game, I think it's just the mastery of anticipatory skill. I think that is, uh, we talked about it with the high school guys this year, of just developing insane eye manipulation. You know, and we, we believe this, and I think this is a big difference maker of Elite 11 versus some other uh, quarterback trainers, is we believe everything is with your eyes, and your feet are tied to your eyes. You hear a lot of times on television, uh, it's all about his footwork in the pocket. I, I don't agree with that. I think that your feet follow your eyes, kind of like if you're driving a car and you look to the right, the car goes to the right. But we teach our guys that like you got to see the dental floss coming out of your eyeballs connected to your feet. So to me, the biggest area of growth for every quarterback, Jalen as well, is where he understands where the progression is going in his offense in a pure progression system of understanding that my eyes are going there, my feet are going there, and I can rip the ball and anticipate that on a critical DND, on a third and seven backed up. And those are the areas that every quarterback and improve upon um and i think watching him go through even some of the drills because the counselors this year participated more than they ever have which was which was awesome it's probably our best counselor year ever um, that's an area that that'll be fun to watch him and, and quite frankly to him and and jared stidham and the rest of the guys drew lock uh, all the guys that were there just continue to go there because that's that's where the magic is when you look at the brady's the breeze the roethlisberger's the big time big time players they're insanely manipulative in the way that they look, the subtleties of the position. We're talking to Yogi Roth, which is a Pac-12 analyst, college football analyst. He's part of the Elite 11 there, the big weekend. He's one of the staff members. Uh, he's been a part of a big dynasty there at USC. We're talking about his uh, his analysis of the quarterbacks. Let me move to Tua here just for a couple of minutes. I know we've given a breakdown, but we had a caller earlier that described it as Ken Griffey Jr. swinging the ball. It's so easy to fall in love the way that he spins and throws the football. Talk about the pluses and minuses of Tua Tonga Valoa. Yeah, no, that's a, such a funny comparison. You know, we all grew up with Ken Griffey in the backwards hat, right? Sure. Um, Tua's got that that vibe to him. I, I think Lucky's always looked prettier, to be honest. You know, they from do. Liner um, to, to Tua. You know, Matt was the guy that I got to coach my first year at the staff at SC. Uh, but yeah, the ball. You know, even his younger brother, same deal. I'm sure we'll get to him, but. It, it just pops, right? We like to say, you know, can, can the ball speak? You know, does the ball finish on the face mask? I look at the revolution. You know, if you had one of those NFL films, cameras, and, you know, you see the spinning, the revolution of the ball, the more revolution, the louder the ball speaks. And for Tua, it is, whoo, right? I mean, you saw that when they won the national title game with that throw. Same deal. I mean, first night, we replicated that throw with all the campers, and everybody had a chance to make that throw including the counselors. And Tua made it, literally might as well have been the national title game. It was the like same drop, same throw, ball finished the same exact way, and the crowd went wild. But what was fun is that uh, Leah, his younger brother, came up and did the exact same thing on the very next snap. So we had the competition going back and forth um, you know, into the evening. Uh, but, but overall, Tua was special. We felt that way at the Elite 11. I mean, he was a guy who came in, wasn't very highly ranked, uh, went back to the islands and did the work, cleaning up his feet. Uh, cleaning up his eyes, and came out in the Elite 11 and ripped it. Um, again, another guy who has will be a factor, which I defined earlier. He makes everyone around him better. It doesn't matter your background, where you're from, or what your beliefs are, what color you are, how you talk, the way you learn, how you think. I mean, he just rallies. And uh, I think Jalen does, too. Different personality types, for sure. Uh, but too special there. Um, uh, he reminds me um, a little bit of Russell Wilson. I spent some time around the Seahawks. You know, in that regard of kind of having, we call it DQs, you know, dude qualities where guys are going to lean into you. Um, and, and I think they both do. I mean, to, to think about it, you, I'm sure you talked about it ad nauseum, but to start as a true freshman at Alabama, whether you were Jalen or whether you were Tua and coming in uh, in that moment that he did in the second half to Natty, you got some special stuff to you. And, uh, and they both have those natural traits, and, and Tua does as well. I mean, he was. He was what I would hope I would see, you know, and what we expected and, and just a more mature version of what we saw when he won the MVP a couple of years ago. But, Yogi, he went through the injury and did not participate in a lot of spring practice. How hard yeah. is it to pick up a ball in a lead 11-type role and be able to come in? And maybe he didn't have the best weekend, but, uh, you know, he, he was able to make a lot of throws, and, and we saw a lot of on YouTube, a lot of video clips. I mean, how hard is that to go the absence and then now pick up a ball and looks like he hadn't missed a beat uh, with the injury? Yeah, I don't think it's that hard. I think when, when you have thrown 
the amount of balls that he has. Um, that's who you are, right? I think the hard part is to tying everything together, right? So if he rolled out and it was 11 on 11 against an Alabama defense, that to me is where like you miss on the reps, you know, picking up and dropping dimes and ripping the ball. That that's, I mean, I, I didn't meet to until, uh, you know, two years ago, two plus years ago, the elite 11, but I would imagine if we met in eighth grade or 10th grade, he'd always been able to throw the ball. You know, I, I'm sure that's just, I think that's a natural skill that he has, but, but it does look different. You know, that's the truth. You know, and same thing with Leah, you know, it does look different. Um, when he, you know, when he drops back and, and lets it rip, he's got, that's a, we call a unique trait, you know, unique trait for him is how the ball speaks. And, uh, it spoke over the weekend for sure. Is he on the same pace to Leah and Tua as Tua was as going into his senior season there at the elite 11 camp? I, you know, that's, that's a, that's a good question. I don't know. You know, you watch Leah's tape and, uh, you know, I, I said, Whoa, this is, this is impressive. He makes some big, big time kind of throws. I and mean, I'm looking at my evaluation now. And one of my notes was plays at a different speed than everybody. You know, um, I didn't know what he would look like in person because I hadn't seen him. You know, I, I wasn't on the regional tour. Uh, but when I first met him and then watched him play and gotten to know his spirit and his personality, uh, I'll tell you what, it's impressive. You know, Tua had more hype around him, I think. Um, so you kind of expected more. I think for Leah, you know, I didn't have the, the expectation that we had for Tua. Uh, but he came out and, uh, Man, I, I've talked to a guy. I've been on the phone pretty much all day talking about you know the Elite Eleven, and he was impressive. I mean, it's just different than than everybody else. I mean, it's the same thing with Tua. You know, that's their unique trait. Um, everybody else has one, uh, but I think for for Talia Tagovailoa, it's it's in person, it's real. You know, and and it's interesting to see uh, you know how his career how his career progresses. I'd love to get your thoughts on Paul Tyson as well. Yeah, no, for sure. Paul was fun. It was great. I got to bump into his parents um, uh, yesterday after the camp. I ran into his mom in the elevator, and uh, we were both in in France uh, a couple of days before the Elite Eleven. I was over there on a holiday, and and she was over there for a reason as well. And it was kind of fun to just bond over that around the family. And then, of course, you read about it, you learn about him. We know the pedigree, right, with Sarah Bryan, etc. And then when you sit down and talk to him, um, he's got he's got a, like that that sense of humor to him that you want in a quarterback um, and he can instantly switch and be a guy who we like to say can embrace the burden of influence, right? You have that at the quarterback position. You have the burden of influence, meaning I can throw a pick and somebody can get fired. I can throw a touchdown and somebody can get an extension, right? That's just how the position goes. When you look at the highest, your team wins, you're up for it. You can have great numbers. Your team doesn't win. Majority of the time, you're not going to be up for it. So I think he gets, where he's at, he gets the pressure that's going to be associated with him because of his lineage, uh, and he also gets the work that it takes. Um, and I and I like that, and I embrace that. We bring these kids in on Saturday, which is the second day. We wake them up at five in the morning. We take them to yoga. Uh, they're blindfolded in yoga, hot yoga. Their minds are blown. Half of them have never done that. More than half of them have never done it. And we take them to the beach, and we did a uh, session with our high performance psychologist, Dr. Michael Gervais, who's also the psychologist for the Seahawks, among dozens of Olympians, I think the best in the world at what he does. And then we bring him back to the hotel and we grill him. And they go on a five, uh, basically five period rotation from learning defenses from Jim Mora, uh, former head coach of the Falcons, Seahawks, and most recently UCLA, teaching them how defenses attack quarterback. And then they eventually rotate into a room, which we call the pro combine room, which we treat it like the NFL combine. So Trent Dilfer, myself, Brian Stump, the president of Elite 11, Matt James, who's the head coach on the regional tour circuit, and Joey Roberts, who's the director of player personnel, and we grill them. And, and Bucky, Brooks is there. Bucky Brooks is there from the NFL Network, who was a, an NFL scout for a while. And we treat it like the NFL Combine. So they basically sit in a chair, but we stare at them, and we just go at it and ask them uncomfortable questions, silly questions, football questions, whatever it may be, and we want to hear how they respond. And for, for Paul, he was phenomenal. And we talked about understanding the legacy that is just naturally part of his life and understanding that he has to differentiate between him and the legacy. Because when you get on the field, nobody's going to care. And if anything, it's going to fuel a defensive player or someone trying to stop you. And it shouldn't be fuel for you because it's so exterior to you. You know, 
his family being who they are is never going to make him a better player. To be able to talk him through those things like that and the mental skills around that uh, was awesome. I think he's he's a really fun young man. You look at his size, look at his frame, how he gets the ball out, how he understands what we call functional football intelligence, his understanding of the game. Um, it's really fun to be around this young man. I can't wait to watch him fill out his body. Um, and, of course, he's, he's not going to have to play day one, because I wouldn't imagine that. I'm going to be able to sit uh, for, for, you know, I'd imagine at least one year. So that position, if both of those remain committed and eventually signed, will be one that clearly would be fun to track. The two guys that are different in body type, but similar in terms of being pure passers. Yogi, I pre- th- appreciate you for coming on and being a part of the program. Your delivery is always aw- awesome. Your positive attitudes, uh, respectable, man. Thank you again for being a part of the show here in Tuscaloosa. You got it, man. Thank you.